All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 30th day of September. That's the last day of September, I believe, in the year of our Lord, 2024. It's a Monday. Oh, yeah. It's hard to keep track of sometimes when you're retired and every day is pretty much the same as every other day. You don't have anything you particularly have to do. Although I do see my grass is growing again since it rained uh, for the first time in a while. Which is, you know, if this is harvest time, the farmers generally need to have a dry period. Uh, but they do need some rain, too. Of course, they'll, all the corn and soybeans are just going to go into industrial processes. They don't grow food anymore. Or gasoline. You know, the worst thing you can put in gas is alcohol. It is not good for, for mechanical stuff. And it is energy inefficient. It's a net loss, I believe. Uh, I mean, you calculate the system's inputs versus the, the energy value. Just like a lot of so-called renewables, it's a net loss. It's a net loss. Unless it's basically free, you know. No. Yeah, all these... Uh, the whole planet's solar-powered. Let's get a handle on things here. It's just that our modern society is, well... Decadent in this in extreme. I woke up this morning. I was uh, laying there and I was sort of uh, surveying the the planet with my spiritual eyes in a way. I didn't actually see visions or anything like that, but I just just meditating on it, you know, and looking at things. And it's like, wow, this planet is a planet of zombies. The the spirit, the uh, the Walking Dead. Spiritually dead people walking everywhere. And yesterday I decided I needed to go in a different direction, so I sort of cleaned up my Twitter account, with such as it is, and decided I need to focus on people that have not heard the gospel, uh, particularly Muslims. Uh, partly because of what I've seen, but partly from experience. I mean... Uh, uh, when I went over to, to Israel in, in 1985, and I was by myself, I was just walking around, and, uh, you know, I would rather talk to Muslim any day than, than uh, Jews, because Jews are like doubly dead, scripturally. So it's, my experience over there was, uh, is, uh, well, there's a lot of Christian Arabs too, but, uh, I can respect Islam. I mean, they have, well, like Paul talks about when he was talking about the uh, the Jewish people in, in Romans, he says, I, I bear them witness they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And that's completely true about uh, uh, Islam. Islam, when you com compared to the United States, compared to, to most Christianity, which isn't Christian at all, as far as biblically Christian, because you have to be born again to be a Christian, and most of Christianity is not. Not uh, Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. It's and and uh, Orthodoxy is not Christianity. It is a perversion. It was, it is, it has a superficial, some superficial form of Christianity, but Constantine wo uh, wedded it to the state, and state Christianity can never be real Christianity. Because it has to be, uh, can't be uh, something for only few a few people. Jesus said that the way the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few that are that find it. 
So your typical people aren't interested. They just, they, they, they like religion often because it's more comforting than atheists. But it's not, it is not, they don't know God. It's not a relationship with God. It's a relationship with the church, with the, with the organization, with the, uh, something that, that claims to provide them with uh, hope of heaven through the organization and sacraments. All the cults do the same thing. Uh, in Islam, there's not actually that much hope there. But, but they have a zeal for God, and th there is, they do worship the God of Abraham. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'll look at Jerusalem and like, oh God, what a mess. The most spiritually dead place I've ever been in my life. I mean, I've been to New Age festivals. I've walked in adult, God, not adult, uh, uh, occult bookstores. You know, uh, but that is not, is the worst place I've ever walked was 1985. I can remember, in fact, I've actually seen that neighborhood uh, recently on YouTube where uh, the 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 Jew, the police thugs dressed in black were assaulting and and committing battery on on uh, ultra orthodox believers. You know, you see the men with the, the 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 tall hats, fur hats, or whatever, and dressed in these black robes, and and that because they see they don't recognize the legitimacy. Of the state of Israel, they believe that that only the Messiah can can reestablish Israel, and and uh, now the the Supreme Court in Israel has said they have to serve in the military too. There's going to be more. They will riot. The the, it's, the, the they will cast stones definitely. Yeah, uh, Maya Sharim, uh, you don't want to drive through that neighborhood on the Sabbath in a vehicle. You might get your windshield, your wi windows all busted out. Um, but I was, I remember walking one uh, Sabbath evening, so this would be like a, a Friday night in real time <laughs> for the rest of us in those neighborhoods. It's sort of like this is like the the, uh, the northwest corner of Jerusalem. It's directly north of the old city. And that's where I was staying up there in a youth hostel, which is like a cheap hotel. <laughs> and it was cheap. But So I was walking down there, and I'm, I'm by myself, and the, the sun has is gone down, so it is the Sabbath. And I hear, it's, it's just the, the spiritual darkness, and I hear the, these, this sounds like moaning and wailing coming up out of the earth almost, because in that part of the city, a lot of it is, over the years, it's, it's, the street level's gone up and up and up on the buildings. And so there's, it'd be down below street level and coming up through windows and that just the, uh, there's, there's Sabbath prayers, I suppose. And it, it was like, I'm walking through hell. The, the spiritual darkness, uh, that Satan just over that place, that whole country was just, to, to be a born-again Christian there, you're walking through the kingdom of Satan. The darkness just pervades it. It's like this heavy pressure around you all the time. But some amazing thing is, you know, where, where the scripture says, where two or more gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. And that actually, we actually experience that because if you, they're another born-again believer and if you're there talking with them and you're talking about Christ, you're, you're worshiping, really. And uh, it's just gone. That, that, that All of a sudden there's light and freedom and liberty and air. You can breathe the air. 
It's amazing. The spiritual reality of it, you actually experience it. But the, the darkness is, is just so thick over there. Uh, and it's, it's especially in the, in the Jewish community. And at that time, most of the Jewish community, at least half of Israel, was secularist. In other words, they were atheists. They weren't even practicing Judaism. So today, you know, you look at what's going on in the world, and, you know, I think Satan has his throne exists in multiple places. Washington is one of his favorite thrones, it's right there in the Oval Office. He's the one that stands behind the, the person sitting at the desk with his strings or his hand, his sock puppet. Definitely so. <laughs> but uh, Jerusalem, the, the, the absolute insanity of what's going on. The insanity. The murderous insanity. They don't even hide it anymore. I saw some of that when I was over there, but nothing on the scale I see today. This, The evil, just the absolute evil the murderous intent uh, the, the, this is not a total aberration in Judaism it, it's in the Talmud there's an entire section about the, the, the relationship you know the, the Talmud's collections of writings of various or sayings of various rabbis over, over a period of time so the, the, uh, rabbinic Judaism is, they are the descendants of the Pharisees, literally. That, that the Pharisees were the ones that became the, uh, the, the spiritual, um, they, they became the, the dominant spiritual thing. The Sadducees were associated with the temple uh, and the priests. Uh, of course, with associated with the temple, with the, with the destruction of the temple in seventy A.D., it is the Pharisees that, uh, and you had the the Christian believers, but the Christian believers, the Jewish Christian believers, because in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile, Gentile simply blended in and intermarried and everything else. Because why not? Why not? Uh, and because un under the new covenant, you know, circumcision is not important, all that stuff, it's done away with. So the Pharisees took their stuff and they were centered in the synagogues anyway. That was their institutions. So they were able to transition uh, without the temple. And... They created, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, a particular rabbi, Akiva, I think it was. Uh, they, they created a standardized Torah, uh, and uh, they began to compile the, uh, written tr the oral traditions into, uh, uh, what, what's it called? Well, you have the, 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 Mish the Mishnah and the, uh, the, the Talmud. Uh, I can't remember the exact order, but they gradually began to compile and write down their traditions and establish. Uh, what, so what we have today in Orthodox Judaism is the religion of the Pharisees. And if you read the Talmud, you, and you, if you've read the, the New Testament, yeah, this is the Pharisees. This is the Pharisees. Uh, they, they act just like the Pharisees. <laughs> they, they, they think they can snooker God, just like the Pharisees in Jesus' day uh, that he was contending with. They would uh, the they the the uh, they would nullify the commandments with their traditions to get around them, and you can see that all through the Talmud. So they they think they can pull a fast one on God with uh, with their their minds. It's like no, you can't do that. <laughs> God knows exactly what you're doing. Yeah, when you hire the 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 neighbor Gentile boy to flip your light switch on and off. On the Sabbath. But you don't really hire him. You just give him the idea that if he does this, you'll give him a gift. <laughs> you know, like politicians, the same, same kind of stuff. 
And it's like, you read that and uh, yeah, nope. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. God is not a fool. But they act like, you know, these, these rabbis, you read it in the, the Talmud and you see this stuff and it's just, really? Spiritual darkness, blindness is an arrogance. Uh, the flesh, it's not unique. It's not unique to a, a particular ethnic group. <laughs> It's just, ah, uh, but when you see, when you reject the light, uh, you you go even deeper into darkness. So you, if God reveals light to you in re, and you reject it, you end up in a worse situation than you were before. And the scripture is very plain. The, the New Testament is very plain that that happens. That is the, the, the judgment of God. Uh, he gives you over to your darkness. So you just plunge into that. You turn away from him, so which direction you're headed? You're headed to the dark. And it's, it's uh, you're doing it to yourself. And you look at, at society today, you look at the United States today, the West in general, because it's really blended into one big blob now. It is, it is the most decadent, corrupt, spiritually dead civilization that's ever existed on this planet. It's, it's the end. We're at the end. The, not the end of the world, uh, the end of the age. The, you know, it's, it's time to look up because Christ is coming. And I, I feel so sorry for some of these Christians that have abandoned premillennialism, a imminent return of Christ, relatively imminent at least, it, for postmillennialism where Christians have to build the kingdom of God and once Christianity has conquered the world, then, then Christ can come back. And we'll give him the keys to his kingdom once we've built it. That's post-millennialism. That is the most absurd, hopeless, miserable thing there is. And I see some people that have, have gone over to that thinking that was more hopeful. <laughs> well, guess what? That's not the way things are going. Yeah, and they call the other escapism uh, that Jesus would perhaps come today. Well, thank God. I hope so. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to speculate about the exact time. The, 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 the New Testament is not exactly clear on that. That's why you have multiple views in premillennialism. Does he come before the so-called tribulation, which we're always, the church is always in tribulation. If you're a born-again Christian in this world, you are a square peg in a world full of round holes. There is no place for you in this world. Uh, you can you try to fit in, but it's you're you'll be miserable. It's just it's just the way it is because we're not we're not home. We're, remember that uh, that uh, I, actually I like the I like the minor key in it too. The uh, uh, the the Negro spiritual um, how does that go? A poor wayfaring stranger. I'm nothing but a poor wayfaring stranger walking through this world of woe. That's what Christians are. Born again, born again Christians. If you are comfortable in this world, that should be a sign to you that you're not born again. If you love this world, if you love politics, if you love power, if you love wealth, you are not born again. You may be happy in that for now. Uh, that's a bad sign. That's a bad sign. And some, some, I think I'm worse than most in some ways because I got saved out of such a deep, dark hole that, yeah, the, 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 the story of the demoniac of the gatherings, yeah, yeah, right there, pretty much. Not quite that bad, maybe, but, yeah. Demon possessed, out of my mind, violent. Yep, yeah. it's what happens if you go uh, trespassing in the wrong spots, go fooling around looking for God in the wrong places, do things the wrong way, get yourself involved in drugs. Uh, 
to try to be enlightened or whatever. Or just fooling around. And you can get... Well, it happens with other things, too. Uh, sexual uh, stuff can lead you into dark places. This whole society has been engulfed in that. Uh, but, but looking, you look, I look at, at most of what's called Christianity is dead. It doesn't have the gospel. It, it is a form of religion. It, it has out, an outward... It's like a Christmas tree. <laughs> How, how is dead religion like a Christmas tree? It's pretty, right? It's, it's sparkly, it's twinkly, it's got glitter, it's got all these things on it. But what does it have to do with Christ? Not a single thing. It has nothing to do with Christ. Well, I like it. Well, I used to like them too, but I, I, I look at it now and I say... That is, that is nothing but a distraction. Christmas is supposed to be the remembrance of God sending a Savior into this world, the only Savior into this world. What does a Christmas tree have to do with remembering that? Not a single thing. What is all of the materialism, all the gift givings, all the traditions of this world? It's all satanic deception to keep you from thinking about Jesus Christ and your need for a Savior. All in the churches with their live menageries. You know, they got a thing where they churches bring in living donkeys and sheep and whatever. What does that have to do with Jesus Christ? Yes, he was born in a stable a shelter, for an animal shelter, and laid in a manger, which is a feed trough. It's where you put the, the forage for donkeys or camels or whatever, rather than on the floor to get trampled on and pooped on and everything else. Yes, because it's relatively clean. But that is not the point. People, I've, I've observed over the almost 50 years I've been a born-again Christian now. What is it? At least 48. <laughs> Coming up on it quick. Uh, that people don't, that, that what they want to do, it's like it's, they can't stand the light. So they want to divert their vision. To, from the light to unimportant things. I, I've known quite well a man that, that, that he was always interested in these odd details in the parables or in, or, or, or in the, the history. Uh, he was interested in, like, in the donkey that Jesus rode or uh, in the revelation, the, the robe, the garment of Christ, rather than Christ himself. That troubles me. It troubles me because it's, it's not a good sign. So there, there's a certain, you look at, uh, uh, at Roman Catholicism, the biggest Christian sect in the world. And when the world thinks of, of Christianity generally, that's what they think about. Uh, the Muslims tend to think more of orthodoxy. But what do they, you know, I was thinking back in history, and at the very time that Islam was rising up and conquering much of uh, the Christian world. North Africa was all Christian, and Islam just swept right through the Middle East and down through North Africa uh, very, very quickly. Just on, uh, almost incredibly fast. And then they began to go up into Spain, and of course into Europe spread all over the place, into India, into, into you know, in, into the uh, the Pacific, you know, like uh, the, some of the biggest uh, uh, Christian or Islamic countries are, are like uh, Malaysia and those, those the island things down there, Philippines, others, they got huge, uh, the most populous uh, Muslim nations in the world are in those areas. Actually, India, too, they've got a, even though they split, it used to be, India and Pakistan used to be one. 
and then they split because of the tension between the Hindus and the Muslims. And there's other sects in there too, the Sikhs and others. But and there's Christian Christians have been in India since uh, the first century, at least according to the tradition. They that they uh, there's a uh, in the south part of India, I think it's the south east side. There's uh, Christian communities down there that claim that uh, uh, that Thomas, the Apostle Thomas, brought the gospel there, and that's certainly possible. There was uh, there was trade all over the place. It was not a primitive world back then. But as I was thinking about this, is too that that. Christianity has become so corrupted that it's not Christian. So the, when Islam sees Christianity, and I was going to finish my thought there, at the time that Islam was rising and spreading very rapidly, and Christians, many of the Christians in the Middle East, embraced Islam as a deliverance from from the the Byzantines, the the Roman Empire, the the Eastern Empire which was the main one. Rome, the Western Roman Empire was pretty much deceased. It had degenerated into just the papacy. Uh, the, the Vandals and the others overran the West uh, in the 4th, 5th century. And it, it, Rome was no longer an imperial power there anymore. It had decayed. Uh, the city was like Detroit after Constantine moved the capital to to uh, what is today Istanbul, Constantinople, the city of Constantine, uh, built as a city. That, I think the biggest dome, uh, the biggest church constructed as a church, is Hagia Sophia in in the city of Insta Istanbul, uh, and that was built by Constantine, and it is now a mosque again. Became a mosque when the uh, when Constantinople was finally conquered in 1453, but the empire had shrunk down now. That, that, is, that is Rome. That was still the Roman Empire. The Byzantines were the Roman Empire. So Muslims refer to those as the, the Romans, because they were. We got a Western twisted view of things. Uh, but, see, when, when the Muslims looked at at Christianity of the days in Muhammad, he would have seen this. So you see that in the Quran, it says, um, admonishing Christians, don't say three, three gods. Well, Christi Christianity had become so idolatrous that, yeah, I'd probably, I, in fact, I've seen that uh, down where I lived in the border. Uh, over a, a plaque, a so-called Christian plaque on a house down there in my neighborhood, just a couple of houses down. It was uh, in Spanish, but it said, Father, Son, and uh, uh, the Virgin Mary. Three gods. Tres dioses. Three gods. That is, and the idolatry there at the at the very time that Islam was was taking things over, there was a controversy in the church, the official uh, imperial church, which was the only legit church at that time. You had Rome over there because they were isolated, doing their own thing more or less, the papacy, but. Uh, and that was that was the, the the hinterlands. That was the barbaric part. The re reason was moved to start with to Constantinople is Rome was was not the center of activity. It would be like putting the American capital, well, in Washington, <laughs> or, or uh, in Hawaii or something, you know, or or Alaska. It's like. No, that's or or North Dakota. Uh, not quite the center of activity. So, but what was going on? Because Christianity had become so corrupt, there was a scandal in the church, and 
the an, an emperor came to power, and the emperor is the head of the church, say, under that system. The, yeah, it's definitely, it's a state religion. So, in the and religion serves the interest of the state. So there, there was uh, idolatry had come in very heavily. The worship of images had had you know gradually come in and totally uh, uh, pro prohibited by the New Testament. Paul says, uh, "Flee from that." Or not Paul. I'm saying uh, John. John in his, I think it's one of his epistles says, "Flee images, icons." In the West or in the East, they they never went so much to the three-dimensional things, but it's more uh, flat paintings. Uh, in, in, the east, or in the West, they went three-dimensional. The East was, you have the icons. In the West, you have the full pagan Roman-style idols. Uh, to this day, you look at the Vatican, filled with them, and say that they don't worship these images. Well, you haven't been in Catholic churches, real Catholic churches, like you go down to the Mexican border. You go down farther into Mexico, it's even more so. Yes, they worship the images. John, Pope John Paul II talked about the validity of this and how the image has a special connection to what it represents. Well, that's what pagans have always believed. They didn't believe the, the marble or the, the wood was the god itself, but the, the carving was a, a portal or a link or a, an, um, a connection point to that deity. Pagans aren't utterly, you know, they're human beings. <laughs> they're not complete idiots. But it's so. But during during this very time with 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 Muhammad, Muhammad's thing was uh, he was again. There was three hundred and sixty idols in Mecca, one for every day of the year. One a uh, three hundred and sixty. These represented three hundred and sixty gods. And Muhammad, in this sense, Muhammad is a prophet of the a proclaimer of the one true God. He's not totally illegitimate, okay? He's not a prophet necessarily sent by God, but I mean, he was a proclaimer, a preacher of the God of Abraham. And there were Jewish tribes in Arabia. There were Christians in Arabia. And he was a, uh, a caravan merchant. He married a, a, a rich widow who was a who had uh, had all this caravan stuff, uh, a widow much older than he was. And uh, he, uh, so he was involved in this trade. So he's traveling about in these caravans and encounters all these different things. Uh, Arabia was a crossbed of activity. I mean, you look on the map and you go up to Europe, you can go into Africa, you can go over uh, to India and China. And uh, moving by ship was, you got it around, around by water. If you were going to go from Jerusalem to Rome, you took a boat. That's just our, and there was huge traffic between Egypt and Rome. Rome was sucked everything in. It was... It was a, a, a the imperial the great imperial. What was that that, that creature on Star Wars, Jabba the Hut, the, the the imperial hut, just sucking up life from everything else. That's how empires work. They they take the resources from all the places they conquer, and draw it in or control. Suck it in. They live off uh, others. They're like uh, criminal gangs. Gang leaders do the same thing. Fallen humanity. The the obsess self centeredness. So you 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 use others for your own advantage. Uh, but 
at the same time that Islam was spreading and Islam was absolute abhorrence of idols or anything that is uh, other than the worship of the one God, of the God of Abraham. And you'll hear all kinds of things about Allah is just one of the 360. And Allah, the, the word Allah means God. It, it's not even a name. It's just like we talk about God. We don't usually say Yahweh. Jehovah is just a corruption. Yahweh. We don't we don't talk about Yahweh usually. Uh, the Jews won't even pronounce the name. So the Lord is is a title. It's not a or God is a, a a noun that identifies a being, the being. It's not a name. In fact, I was thinking the other day. Yesterday, I was just, I, I thought about. The encounter that Moses had, it just crossed my mind in the context of something with, uh, with G God calling him when he was uh, in exile, sort of, in uh, uh, the desert, which we don't know if that was the Sinai or more likely Arabia. Could very well have been in Arabia. Um, The, 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 of course, the climate's changed since then too. So, but uh, the when God ap appears to him by the, the burning bush, and God says, "I'm going to send you to my people, to your people, and you're going to bring them out, deliver them." And it's like, really, <laughs> I'm nothing but a shepherd. Uh, God had reduced him from being second to you know the the son, the adopted son of Pharaoh down to that. You have to become nothing before God can use you. <laughs> you otherwise you're full of yourself. Uh, but still too much. <laughs> but the, the uh, what it uh, but Moses said, who shall I s tell them you are? What is your name that I might tell your people? You know, what God? What, co what God? What, what God are you? Which one are you? This is Moses. This is a question. Which God are you? What's your name? And, you know, he, God has said, I'm the God of your fathers. What's your name? It's like, so if there's only, you know, it's, it's almost like God was surprised by the question. Because there's only one God. It's like, but in the pagan world, it's all in Egypt, all these gods. They all have names. So when they ask me what God is, is what's his name, what am I supposed to tell them? It's almost like if God said, hmm, what shall I say? God, God doesn't need a name. He's God. I mean, like uh, he, names are to, to distinguish one from another, right? Why do people have names? To distinguish us from all the other people. But there's only one God. So it's like, huh, what shall I say? A little bit of, just crossed my mind, just a thought. I'm not saying this. Don't take this as, as a biblical fact, but I just had the impression there that like God was a little bit surprised by the question, perhaps. And so God says, God says, I am that I am. So therefore, then he says, tell them I am have sent you. It's almost like God, what shall I call myself? So the, the I am, because it's not a name, really. It's, it's I am, I'm just, is, I am, I am the one. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the only God there is. It's like, I don't have a, diff a name to distinguish me be for the from the other gods like me because there are no other gods like me. I don't na need a name, but there is a name given now. What is it? The name Yahweh, God says. Ya By the way, Yahweh is a, a, a form of the, of the verb to be. So I am. It's essentially the same as the name Yahweh. In its root. 
So that was rather, you know, like, hmm. But that, that is God that the Muslims worship. And, and there, Islam is is closer to Christianity than Judaism is because Islam does not reject Jesus Christ. It does not. It calls him the Messiah, the Son of Mary, born of a virgin, the one that that that, that ascended into heaven. Uh, many of them don't believe he was crucified. There's some contention about that. Depends how you interpret the Quran. But it's like they worship the God Christians worship, but they do not know him, which is true about Roman Catholics. It's true about the Orthodox. Most people in these things. They're, they're, they're born-again people sprinkled around. Most Protestants, most evangelicals and Pentecostals and Charismatics do not know him. They might imagine they do, but they... Do you know God? Does he dwell in you? Does Christ dwell in you? Have you been born again? Otherwise, you worship the God you do not know. In the United States, it's more like they use the middle finger of worship, the anti-worship finger. So many. But Islam recognizes that Jesus is greater than Muhammad. Jesus does miracles, including, now this is, in the Quran, this comes from some pseudo-Christian fables, or it exists as some pseudo-Christian fables from a prior time that a caravan merchant could have very well encountered in that day, that Jesus, as a little child, making a, a, uh, a bird of clay and then breathing life to into it and it becomes a true living bird. Who can do that other than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And the God of Ishmael. I have to remember that 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 uh, the Arabs are the children of Ishmael, whom God also blessed. The son, the first son of Abraham. Now, they don't have the same mother. Isaac and Isaac was the son of promise. Ishmael was the son of human attempts to have a son instead of God's working a miracle. But there, there is, uh, you know, I've... I, I, I admire the zeal of the Muslims. I think they are closer to God than, than uh, the Jews I encountered in Israel. They were definitely friendlier. Um, they're not Christians. They're not saved. But I, they need to hear the gospel. And I, I was looking the other day, and the last time I looked... On, you know, world uh, stats, there was like 1.2 billion in the world. Now there's 1.9 billion estimate. Why am I wasting my time talking to corrupted Christians? <laughs> so I need to focus on that a little bit more and uh, probably create a second channel here to focus on that instead of this nonsense. Because a lot of this is nonsense. You know, it, understanding what's going on in this world today is not the same as fixing it. It doesn't bring life. It can be helpful. We need to understand what's going on so we're not deceived. But you know, speaking of being deceived, 
So anyway, I'm, I'm going to, I, I, this is something too. I, I thought about this and say, God, but I'm not up to it. I'm not up to it. I'm an empty vessel. God's up to it, but, but Paul said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And I understand that. See, when, we're, when we think we're strong, when we think we can do it, we're full of ourselves. When we're empty, when we're helpless, when we're weak, and we're, when we're beggars, and we have to depend on God, because he's all we have then we're strong because we're full of him. You understand? And God likes to keep us in places like that where we can't depend on ourselves. It goes, he, he chooses people to do things that are contrary to their natural abilities and strengths in order that they can't depend on their natural abilities and strength. And the Southern Baptists are the worst examples of ignoring this. Uh, just programs, programs, programs. Man, all flesh, it's all flesh. It's like Rick Warren, all flesh. You know, those kind of, now that's getting dated. Today, the Southern Baptists are just nothing. Why? Because it's all flesh. Flesh gets old and dies. Okay, so I just happened to turn on uh, the internet over here. And I was shocked. I saw something on X. I didn't actually think it was uh, subscribed to Donald Trump, but I, it's like, okay, what is, he, what is he saying today? You got to take a look at this. So this is all you Donald Trump worshipers out there. I hope you're not worshiping Donald Trump. He's he's not a Christian. And this is this should tell you tell you something about him. Uh, the, the church he was raised in was Norman Vincent Peale was the father of positive thinking. Well, not really the father. There was others before him, but. He was on television all the time when I was uh, 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 growing up. You know, they had church broadcasts on Sunday mornings. And he was one of the national ones, Norman Vincent Peale. And his, uh, all, he was supposedly Reformed or Presbyterian, one or the same thing, basically. Uh, and that was the home church of Donald Trump, assuming he actually went there once in a while. But it was all about positive thinking and the power of thinking to get what you want. It was all mind science, which is occultism, really. Uh, Christian science is occultism. It's that. It, it is, it is uh, the, the law of attraction. Uh, it, it's, 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 the occult is full of this where your thinking creates reality. Reality exists in your mind. Well, look at sexual things. Well, it's not even sexual anymore. It's look, look at the gender confusion. That you can be whatever you want to be or need to be because reality only exists in your head. This is, this, this is nihilism. This is Nietzsche, the, the will to power. Ah, oh, it's <laughs> Nietzsche. Didn't he do that thing? The Antichrist. He wasn't. He was an Antichrist. He, he clearly self-identified as such. His 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 philosophy. Of course, he, that's the death of philosophy right there. Because the de de denial of truth. Philosophy is the love of wisdom, which is has to be grounded in truth. So trying to find truth. Uh, and when philosophy just gives up on trying to find truth and decides it's impossible, well, that there's no philosophy anymore. You, uh, but take a look at this. This is this is Donald Trump's account. It was right there in my face. 
Donald Trump. This is at real Donald Trump. Yeah, this has got the blue check mark at all. Donald J. Trump. This is his <coughs> Twitter account. Uh, usually what you see on Twitter is his son, but <coughs> this is Donald himself. Uh, and this man needs to have his lips zippered. He needs to have a, a button or something installed there to keep it shut most of the time. Because every time he opens his mouth, something or twits, tweets, something comes out that is crazy. So this is Donald Trump. And I, I looked at this and said, what the heck? What is this? Donald Trump posting on Twitter, praying. This is a prayer. St. Michael, the archangel. Defend us in battle. This is the Catholic prayer, Roman Catholic prayer. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. Who's he praying to? God? This is idolatry. Anytime you pray to, in, this is shirk. The, the Muslims, they know exactly what this is. This is wrong. This is this is the this is the sinfulness in the the highest degree. Shirk to to ascribe the properties of God to a lesser creature or idol or anything. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. So you're going to trust in Michael rather than God. Good luck with that. May God rebuke him, we, we humbly pray, the devil. Why don't you just talk to God, you dummy? Because he doesn't know God. And do thou, O prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan. Not time yet. And all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Well, you cannot ruin what is dead. You can't ruin a soul that's not a, that's a, that is not born again because it is already ruined. They were ruined, souls were ruined when Adam fell. You have to be born again. You're spiritually dead already when you come into this world. You have to be born again, Jesus said. His words, not mine, his. You must be born of the Spirit. You cannot even see the kingdom of heaven. You can't even perceive the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. Oh, Donald. Is Donald born again now? Why do people? Why would people rather pr uh, pray to an angel than to Christ himself? Because they don't know Christ. And they don't want to get close to him. They they want they're flee they still flee from God. This is manifest proof that Donald Trump is not born again. Born again people don't pray, pray to angels unless they've been momentarily deceived. Because they know God. God is our Father. We know our Father. We know the Lord Jesus Christ. We know the Spirit of God. He dwells in us. This comes out of some Catholic book someplace. <laughs> or or it, it could be in a Protestant book. I mean, it could be an Anglican prayer. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Why are you praying to an angel? Angels are ministering spirits. They were created to be not only the servants of God, but to serve humanity. They are messengers. Of course, if God lives in you, you don't need an intermediary. You don't need an angel to come with a message. See, in the New Testament, we don't see that anymore. Angels may come to deliver from something, but they don't come with messages. Because if you're born again, the Spirit of God himself is in you. 
You don't need a messenger. <laughs> between you and God, there's only one bet between God and his godness, there's only one intermediary, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. As Christ said, they and me and I and you, talking to his Father. He is our connection point to God, the only connection point there is, because he is man and he is God. He is the interface between creation and creator, because he is the creator. And also a creature in his humanity. I guess you could say he's a self-made man. But Donald is praying to Michael. Donald does not know what he's doing. Oh, so is, so is he going to get baptized as a Roman Catholic? Is he going to go pledge fidelity to Pope Francis? Is he going to go kneel to a Pachamama? I don't know. Catholics are like, okay, when is Francis going to die? Please, Lord, soon. But th this is the time we live in. It's all caving in. The, the, everything is going to seed. Like my garden, it's all going to seed. It's about time to turn the chickens out in there. What, there's a little bit still coming, but it, it's all, you, know, you can see, it's the end of the season. In the same way, I can see this is the end of this age. Just look in the Word of God. Look what Jesus said. In the last days, you know, Paul says, in the last days, difficult times will come. You, you look at what the Bible says, it will be coming. And then you got the, the certain people, uh, solely, supposedly Protestant or Reformed Baptists and others out there saying, poo, 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 poo. Post millennialists, poo poo. No, we're going to take over the world and take over the world for Christ. Talk about living in a delusion. Open your eyes, man. Take a look. Can't you see? Have you no spiritual eyes? Can't you see the time? See, the world will be taken by surprise by the return of Christ. But the church won't. We don't know the day or the hour, but we know it's near. He said, when you see all these things happening, look up because your redemption draws near. See, we're strangers and aliens in this world. We don't belong here. We belong with Christ. We'll be on earth with Christ. He is coming down, and he's going to stay. Exactly how that return works out. I'm not going to tell you. I, you know, you can read the book of Revelation. Read the prophets. Read, read what Jesus says in Matthew 24. <clears throat> Realize that is that God deliberately chose to make it a little vague. because he wants us to trust him, not our understanding. But we always have to be a little skeptical, skeptical about our understanding of things. And don't listen to these people that have it all charted out. They're wrong. They are following men or women, not Christ. But we're running out of time. And that's both bad and good. The return of Christ delays because God is not willing that any should perish. And there's some Christians that don't understand that either. Calvinists do not understand God at all. Their God is... Their idea of God is 
worse than the Muslims. Although I think their their idea of God is strongly influenced by some of the same stuff. By pagan philosophy. Aristotle. See, they don't have a proper understanding of God. They worship God, but they worship God in ignorance. As many Christians do also. Again, to be a true Christian, you must be born again. You must have that living relationship with Christ. I don't know how anybody can read the New Testament without understanding that. It is so clear through and through and up through. And how to how that sometimes uh, how it turns into institutional Christianity and sacraments and all this other stuff. How Christmas turns into a Christmas tree and marketing presents. It's all a smokescreen of hell to keep you from seeing the truth. To distract you. And people that aren't born again are willingly distracted. They want to be distracted. They want to cover their eyes from the truth because they flee from the light, as Jesus said in John chapter 3. And this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the, than the light because their deeds are evil. The, the natural action reaction of a sinful person which we are all born into, to the light, to the truth, to God, is to flee. And God has to overcome that. That's why people don't just come to Christ on their own. They run away. They choose something else. They'll choose religion, but when it comes to actually coming to God, there is fear there. Because they haven't been reconciled to him. But that's where they'll find reconciliation. It is in Christ. But Muslims have no forgiveness. See, in the Quran, God simply arbitrarily forgives. It's there, it's but they don't understand. The, Judaism is the same way. Judaism does not have a good understanding of man's fallenness, and, and Islam doesn't have a good understanding of the fallenness of man, the sinfulness of man, and man's and the, the holiness of God. The fact that God, God is merciful, but He's also just. So the cross, they don't understand the cross. Neither of them understand the cross, and I don't think Christians understand the cross either. God had to reconcile something in himself on the cross. How can God, he, God had to reconcile his justice and his word and his holiness with his mercy and grace and love? Because God didn't want to destroy humanity. God loved his creation. God loved Adam, humanity. But yet he was holy and truth and had said, the day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. The wages of sin is death. All humanity was and is under the curse of the law, the law of sin and death. God had to, God could not simply annul what he had said, because God is truth. How could God reconcile his love and his desire to save fallen humanity with his holiness and righteousness, justice, and truth? His own word. 
the penalty of sin had to be paid. So God said, I will pay the penalty myself. God took on human flesh. The Word of God, who was actually the Creator Himself. The Word, the Logos of God, the, the, the face of God, the, 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 the self-revelation of God, however you wanted to try to describe that. No matter what we say when it comes to God, we're probably going to get in trouble. Trying to, to explain this, the one God that is also three internally, but not three separate, not three gods, but one. So the word of God, the one through whom God as a whole created all things, including humanity. The creator steps into creation, clothes himself in human flesh, in the flesh that comes from the original creation. The seed of the woman, the virgin birth is absolutely necessary. Clothes himself in human flesh, flesh of Adam, the flesh of Abraham, the flesh of David. Fulfilling his own words. The Messiah has come into the world. Emmanuel, God with us. So what that name means. And not only walks among us and teaches, but his mission is to go to that cross and die, paying the penalty of his own words. The wages of sin is death. Christ dies for us. He pays the penalty. His mortal humanity, his physical body, the body, the same flesh that Adam had, but yet without sin. He is a second Adam, not a new creature, not a new creation, but of us, truly God of God and man of man. He deliberately lays down his life and deliberately allows sinful men to crucify him. He was not murdered in the sense that he could not have stopped it. He himself said, think ye not that I could, could at, couldn't at once and command God to send, what is it, ten legions of angels? One angel could wipe out an entire world. The amount of power. God, Christ could have just said, Father, kill them. But what did he say instead? Contrary to these corrupted, critical editions of the Bible nowadays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And he said, it is finished, and yielded up his spirit and died. And then three days later, stood up and walked out of the tomb on the third day. That is not a contradiction, by the way. That was his mission. Then for 40 days, he spent time with his disciples, ate with them, spoke with them. They touched him, demonstrating the reality of his resurrection. And then he ascended into heaven in their sight. He was seen on one occasion by more than 500 people. Witnesses of his resurrection. Because his resurrection is the proof that he made full atonement for our sin. 
That is a proof that he accomplished his mission of bearing the sins of the entire world and dying for the sins of the entire world and satisfying God's righteousness, God's justice, God's word, God's holiness and truth so that God is now free to treat sinners as if they weren't sinners. His word his holiness are set aside that he might deal, having been satisfied, not simply ignored, not arbitrarily overlooked, but God fully satisfying his holiness and his truth, his righteousness and his justice. He is now free to treat us with mercy and grace and love. So God has reconciled the problem of humanity the wicked act of Satan in himself so God can save sinners. He saves us. We are his workmanship. Christ purchased everything we need on that cross. And that's what people need to know. That's what the, the 1.9 billion Muslims need to know. And everybody else. Most of Christians don't understand. Most of Christians are not born again. They do not know God. They, are, they know religion. They, they pray to angels because they do not know God. They're afraid of God. They do not know that God has already paid for their sins, past, present, and future. And all they need to do is ask, and that salvation is more than forgiveness. It's reconciliation with God. It's a new birth, a new spirit, a new heart. It is Christ in us. That is the hope of glory. And what is the glory of God? It is to be his very image. You cannot be the image of God, contrary to some of these silly preachers, without God in you, because there is only one God. There are not multiple gods. This is why idols are wrong. Because an idol can never bear the image of God. Only God can bear the image of the God. Because there is only one God. Human beings can never be gods on our own. M Mormons. We can only be the image of God in union with God. Christ in us. Christ in the Father. Only God is good. We cannot be good without God in us. This is what the New Testament is filled with. But people would rather argue about the Bible than read the Bible and believe it. The Bible is not God. The Bible points us to God. We're all idolaters. We'd rather look to something else, something we can control. Something that's less than God. So a lot of people are going to see this, and they're going to say, oh, Donald Trump's a Christian now. <sighs> The very idea that Satan's wandering around trying to ruin souls. They're already ruined. Well, they can become more corrupt, but they're already, if you're devoid of God, you're born that way. Because of the fall. That's why you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. Well, well I think I got the important part in now, so. I'm going to end the video 
How long? Oh, an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. I cannot ever do a short video. God help me.